and welcome to another video. Well, as you've probably already surmised from the title of this video, I am going to be looking at another Petri camera today. Um, before I get to the featured camera today, though, I am going to back up a step and go back to the Petri that I had discussed in an earlier video, uh, which was this Petri 2.8 rangefinder from the late 1950s. And the reason I'm going to talk about this a little bit is this was the direct predecessor to the camera that I'll be featuring today. Um, again, I'm going to repeat a little bit of information here, but this is my 1958-59 um, Petri 2.8 rangefinder. Um, I believe they made this camera up until and through 1960. And then in 1961, uh, most of the Japanese camera manufacturers were starting to incorporate more up-to-date styling in their cameras. And in particular, um, these kind of mid-level rangefinders were starting to really um, come on the scene and with a lot more advanced styling compared to the previous generations. So probably a couple of the more famous examples are the Canon Canonet, which was first released in 1961 and the Minolta Hymatic, which I believe was first released in 1962 or 63. These are two representative cameras that were manufactured for many years um, in many variations and were very popular and great cameras. Um, in 1961, the same year that Canon released the first Canonette, Petri also released um, a very updated version of their rangefinder camera, which actually looks surprisingly similar to the Canon Canonette, and that was the Petri 7. Effectively, they were released at the same time with similar styling characteristics, probably more representative of just the general change in style that was taking place um, around 1960-61. And so um, in 1961, Petri released the Petri 7, and then in 1962, just one year later, they released the Petri 7S, and that's the camera that I'm going to be talking about today. So the Petri 7S is a mildly updated version of the Petri 7, which um, together were pretty significantly changed from the previous generation of Petri rangefinders, especially in terms of styling. Obviously, the styling of this camera is significantly more modern uh, from a 1960s perspective than the styling of that previous generation, um, this Petri 2.8 from the, just a couple of years before. Quite different. So um, again, kind of reflecting the changes in the um, tastes of the times, but also incorporating a few advancements that were taking place in camera technology at the time. Most noticeably, you'll see that this one does have a built-in light meter. Common to cameras of that era, it is a selenium-powered light meter now, being a selenium meter, of course, it um, has the great advantage of not requiring any batteries to operate, but it has a couple of disadvantages, and particularly for cameras um, that are getting to be this age, 60 years old, and especially if you leave a camera's meter exposed to light for many decades, it will eventually go dead. Luckily for me, this particular camera does work. It's been uh, behind a lens cap for most of its life. The other big downside of selenium meters is that they take quite a bit more surface area to get a, a reasonable light output, and they're not very sensitive in low light. But for general photography, they work really well. One last advantage to talk about is you'll note that the meter itself is contained within the diameter of the lens barrel, which means when you put a filter on the lens, the metering is automatically compensating for the filter because the light that the meter is receiving is obviously going through the same filter that the uh, film will be using. Now, to my eye, this is a really lovely little camera and I am really looking forward to putting it to use. And we'll also talk about more of the details and functions of the camera so that you can get acquainted with it as I uh, go out in the field and start shooting. Okay, let's go over the features of the camera um, in no particular order. So uh, on the front of the camera, obviously the lens cap covers both the lens and the selenium meter. I've got the f1.8 model. They also made an f2.8 model. This f1.8 model has a really advanced six element lens, um, which is also amber coated, as you can see here. Other than that, it has many features that are very similar to other fixed lens rangefinders. 
So most of the controls of the camera are on the barrel of the lens. And if we look at the top here, we can see uh, the shutter speed is up here with a shutter speed range of one second to one five hundredth of a second, and then also including bulb mode. And then the next control back is the aperture. There's also the film speed setting uh, readout, which is right here. Now to set the film speed, there is a teeny little tab right on the bottom of the lens that rotates this ring. There are no detentes for this particular setting, so it's uh, one of the, I would say, design flaws here is it's very easy to accidentally bump that film speed while you're shooting, um, especially since it's right basically in line with the shutter speed control dial. So uh, I've made it a practice of just double checking that the film speed is set to the correct film speed every time I start shooting with this camera. Um, now, working our way around the lens barrel, there is a self timer, uh, which is actuated with this lever here. There is, of course, a flash synchronization selection lever. Uh, right now it's set to M-Sync. It can also do X-Sync for electronic flash and F-Class flash bulbs. Rotating around to the other side, this is the focus lever, a very short throw, very easy to use. Now, one slightly unusual design feature is the focus indicator pointer is actually built into the Petri 7S label and is offset from the center line of the lens. Now, it has a uh, readout in the viewfinder for the light meter, but also the 7S has an additional meter readout on the top here, and it's a simple match needle type metering system. So underexposed on one side, overexposed on the other, and then you just adjust the controls um, to your liking until it, you get that little red needle to line up with the center spot of the meter. Now, as for the rest of the controls on the top of the camera, they're pretty straightforward. You have your typical frame counter here, and this is an automatic resetting counter, unlike the previous model, which you had to manually reset. Shutter release button with a standard screw in, cable release socket, um, a cold shoe for flash and other attachments, and of course the film rewind knob. On the back of the camera, um, here's where the film wind lever is. You can see it's set down from the top of the camera. And then the combination viewfinder rangefinder window on this side of the camera. The rest of the back is pretty plain. The bottom has the usual tripod socket and rewind release button. And then on the side here is the catch for the, the rear door. Now going back to the front of the camera, I do want to point out again, this camera has the green omatic system. They did carry this through all the way through the entire run of the 7S, which went up through 1973. But by then, this style of viewfinder was really kind of out of vogue. And so they didn't carry that forward in the next version. Another kind of strange, <laughs> perhaps style feature of the camera that no one seems to understand why is there is this, what appears to be a translucent window, uh, this little bar here, it looks like it's made out of plastic. It doesn't appear to serve any function. It doesn't light anything up like other translucent windows on other cameras do. Um, so it's, it looks to be purely a stylistic decision. It was later deleted in the, in the later 7S models. And so, uh, yeah, one wonders why that was ever included to begin with.
Now the Petrie 7S is of course a fixed lens camera, so it does not have interchangeable lenses. However, uh, Petrie, like many camera manufacturers of that era, produced an auxiliary lens set um, that you could attach to the fixed lens of the Petrie 7S. Now this set allows you to effectively alter the focal length of the lens. Um, there are two lenses in the kit, uh, which is common for the time. So there's a telephoto version, and then there's a wide angle version. And these two lenses change the focal length of the fixed lens on the camera from on the wide angle side, I think it goes down to about 38 millimeters. Um, and on the telephoto side, I think it pushes it out to about 65 millimeters. So it's, it, they're pretty modest changes, but if you do want something other than just the standard 45 millimeter focal length, um, there is a way to do that. Now, the kit that I have, um, I've got the complete box, and I've got the case, and the two lenses, and then also the uh, viewfinder, which allows you to see what the lens is actually going to be taking a picture of. Um, and the way this works, similar to the Petri 2.8 that I demonstrated before, you take your uh, camera, <laughs> the 7S, and then depending on whether you want the wide angle or the telephoto, you simply take the auxiliary lens of your choice and it screws right into the front of the fixed lens. These auxiliary lenses come with their own little plastic lens caps and then once you've taken that off, you are ready to go. Now, in addition to the lens, you also attach the auxiliary viewfinder to the camera's cold shoe like that. And then as you look through that auxiliary viewfinder, it will give you an indication of what the telephoto and wide angle lenses will be taking a picture of. Now, um, you probably are recognizing one sort of serious problem with this arrangement, which is the auxiliary lens screws in over the light meter of the camera. You can see the, lens, the back side of the auxiliary lens uh, does not pr transmit light to the light meter. So according to the instructions, you must first take a light meter reading with the auxiliary lens off of the camera, uh, then put the auxiliary lens on the camera with the settings that you've already measured. And then uh, the fun doesn't end there because you also have to convert the focus distance um, to a different distance than you measure with the rangefinder. So if I demonstrate here, sorry, I'll put this back on. First thing to do is look through the rangefinder, find focus with your rangefinder, and then read the actual distance off of the rangefinder focal distance. So in this case, I'm just under five feet then on the, lens, on the auxiliary lens itself, there is a conversion factor. You take a look at that. My actual measured distance is five feet, and it says I need to adjust the focus to read three and a half feet. So then you adjust the focus down to three and a half feet, and now you are in focus <laughs> for the distance that you just measured. So between that, focus adjustment, and then also having to take your light meter readings without the auxiliary lens in place. Um, it's a fairly cumbersome process. I will say it works pretty well if you're gonna just take one light meter reading and that light meter reading is gonna be consistent for all of your pictures. And then if you're going to be taking all of your pictures at about the same distance, and especially if that distance is infinity, then there's no adjustment. Um, then it works pretty well, but if you have to stop and take a light meter reading for every shot, put the, the auxiliary lens on, take your rangefinder reading, and then translate that into an adjusted uh, focus distance. It's, it's quite cumbersome. Okay, well, what are my final thoughts on this camera? It's a really fun camera to use. It's very light in the hand. All the controls work really well. It feels good, and in my opinion, makes very nice photos. As you can see here in these two examples in particular, the lens is very sharp. It's quite contrasty, and I'm really pleased with these results. As for the camera in more general terms, uh, yeah, it's a fun camera to use, like I said, and it does instill kind of a, a confidence as a photographer that it's going to work right. However, it 
I'll have to say it does have a slightly cheaper feel than the previous generation of this rangefinder line. Now, Petrie did start having financial difficulties in the 1960s. They just weren't able to be competitive with the other Japanese camera manufacturers and unfortunately started a slow demise toward the end of the 1960s that resulted in their filing for bankruptcy in 1977. Now, I don't know if their demise had started by the time they released the 7S in 1961, but it definitely doesn't have the same high quality feel that the previous generation of rangefinders had. And so I suspect they were already starting to cut corners even at this time. Now, having said that, however, uh, like I said, this camera is really nice. It still is a very nice camera. It's still fun to shoot with, uh, perhaps not quite as solid as their previous generation, but uh, definitely still a camera that I'm going to enjoy shooting with.